This is taller than, oh my God. Hi. You can, you can lower it over okay, the good. side if you little, pull the little thing up. Pull thing. No. Uh, in front nope. there. Right nope. there. You've got it. This You've got it. Lies. <laughs> All right. I'll just lord over you. They will. <laughs> you do all the time. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Ron Wilson. Uh, we're doing our self-introductions here. Uh, I'm the chair of the Department of Theater and uh, the director of the MFA acting program with the Cleveland Playhouse. Uh, and um, I have a prepared statement here. Um, I was asked to do a Q&A with our guest a la inside the actor's studio kind of thing, me being James Lipton. Uh, uh, unfortunately for you, I'm not James Lipton, and uh, I'm not that, I don't have that serious, overly elegant voice, and uh, this is not the actor's studio, thank God. Um, however, I do have the pleasure of introducing someone that in a very short time has made significant inroads into one of the most competitive and challenging professions on the planet professional acting. Uh, turn the page. Lipton does that all the time. I know, I know. <laughs> Next With much card. More, much more elan than I did. But That's right. uh, um, Rich Summer, ladies and gentlemen, has come off his Broadway debut as the blustering and flustered Dwayne Wilson in the hit revival of Harvey this past summer. And Rich is best known as Harry Crane, on the multiple Emmy, Golden Globe, and SAG award-winning television series, Mad Men. Uh, mm -hmm. Not bad. And uh, he's appeared in some of television's most popular shows, including a recurring role in The Office, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Law and Order, CSI, Nikita, Ugly Betty, and Burn Notice. Rich made his feature film debut as Anne Hathaway's drinking buddy, Doug, in The Devil Wears Prada. Recently, he's completed work on the feature films Fairhaven, opposite Sarah Paulson and Chris Messina, and The Giant Mechanical Man with Jenna Fisher and Topher Grace. He was born. <laughs> We're all happy about that. In Toledo, Ohio, and raised in Stillwater, Minnesota. He attended Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, where he majored in theater and sang in the Concordia Choir. We'll get to singing things a bit later. Um, he studied improv work at the Brave New Workshop in Minneapolis and started an improv group, the Slush Puppies, mm -hmm. in Moorhead. He received his MFA in acting from Case Western Reserve University in 2004. He's old. Uh, <laughs> he performed at the Cleveland Playhouse in the role of the king in the underpants and also stole the show in his understudy performance. Uh, he had to go on stage to replace one of, uh, one of the actors as the uh, husband in that show and did a fabulous job. Over the years, Rich has uh, been a regular visitor to CWRU, returning in 2006 to teach icebreakers, whatever that is, to students <coughs> in the law school, and again in 2008 to do an improv workshop with our undergraduate theater students. In 2010 and 12, graduating MFA classes from, benefited from his ongoing generosity when he flew in from LA to introduce their New York City agent showcase. Uh, that's a big deal. It really sent them off into the world with a, a little bit of a kick. So it's, his generosity is, is uh, unparalleled in that regard. Along with all of that, he has become a dear friend and a man that as a teacher, I'm very proud to have had the opportunity to work with. So I give you Rich Summer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> And now for the first James Lipton-like question. <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? No, oh, I'm going to uh, <laughs> I've always been curious, um, as I'm sure everyone in the room has been, um, what was Rich Summer like as a child? Mm. Uh, or has he grown out of that? <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is what I wanted. The first day of school <laughs> was that someday this would be happening yes, right now. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> what was a rich summer like as a child? Well, uh, I think uh, much like um, the adult version of myself, mm -hmm. um, pretty uh, gregarious and annoying. Um, uh, perhaps, uh, I know that uh, for some reason when you asked me that, I think about my, my dad uh, got a, a, a video camera in maybe like, um, I don't know, late 80s. and. Uh, 
uh, he could not make a video without um, me taking off my shirt and running in front of uh, the camera. So, um, so that hasn't changed. That has not okay, changed. Good, good, no. Good. <clears throat> No, I have lots of shirtless videos uh, <laughs> from years gone by. Uh, yeah, uh, very, very um, uh, aggressively, aggressively outgoing. That's how at least I was as a kid. I'm, I'm now maybe hopefully a little more uh, subtly outgoing. Yeah, that's my goal. I didn't achieve that. <laughs> so uh, when were you first attracted to the theater, Rich, and, and why? Um, Tell us about the theater. Uh, I think the first play that I saw was at a children's theater, maybe in Akron. I, I, the first eight years, uh, I, I spent my first eight years in Cuyahoga Falls, actually. And, um, um, I th we went and saw Jack and the Beanstalk when I was, I think, five. My mom took me. And then we went after the show. Uh, the actors came out into the little lobby area, and you could meet them afterwards. And I met um, the guy who played the giant. And I just was like, I don't, I, I couldn't, there was this disconnect in my head that he was no longer the giant. He looked a lot like the giant, but he was, you know, much sweeter and uh, more open. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I don't know, there was something in that. Uh, so I started doing plays right after that. I, I was, um, my first role was uh, the title role uh, in Johnny Tremaine uh, at Newberry Elementary School in Cuyahoga Falls. Uh, it's about a 10 minute play. Um, a lot of kicking of cardboard boxes uh, off the stage into the audience uh, that said T on the side and permanent marker. Um, that was really the whole shebang. But I, yeah, I, I sort of fell in, in there and then um, just, got, it was the only thing that I was willing to kind of uh, do my homework on was, mm -hmm. was uh, learning lines. So I kind of stuck with that. Okay, okay. Inspired. <laughs> um, one question that's always interesting in terms of people who take this work on as a, as a, as a life, livelihood uh, is, when did you actually start thinking about the theater as your life's work? Um, there actually was a, a moment where, I mean, I thought about it in undergrad, um, about that I wanted to be an actor, but I didn't quite uh, understand what that entailed, I think. And uh, you know, I went to a liberal arts school, which, um, and I majored in theater, but but that involved that was not really an acting focused thing. It was you know, you were building sets or you were uh, you know uh, painting things or you know selling tickets and and also did an acting class and also did you know um, history classes and whatnot. But I um, when I graduated from undergrad, I went to Minneapolis and um, I thought I was going to do radio. That was kind of my first. Like, that was the way I thought I could practically do the thing that I, you know, I wanted to, wanted to do acting, but I thought that made no sense, so I, I thought I would try radio. And I did radio for about six months, and it was, it's, by the way, like the worst. It's the worst. Um, <laughs> it's just the worst. Um, I, I still think it's uh, okay, but uh, now that everybody can have podcasts, you can do it by yourself, and you don't have any uh, politics. Um, anyway. So I stopped doing that, and then I had to get another job, and I was working at a, um, uh, a photo plant in uh, Edina, Minnesota, where um, like Chicago would send in their photo orders, film, our place would develop them, and then I would stuff them in envelopes and send them out. Uh, really, uh, it's what a theater major uh, really is qualified for. Um, and so I was uh, stuffing these envelopes with my boss, and my boss said to me, um, you know, uh, Literally, I started here exactly like this. He was like, I came in here, I was doing what you're doing. People liked me, so I am, um, you know, I've been working my way up and now I'm the manager. He's like, I really think, I really, and it was a genuine, beautiful thing that he was like, I really think you could do this. And I was like, oh, wow, 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 wow. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I went, I, I took my lunch break and I went out to my car and I called my undergrad professor and said, how do I get into grad school? And um, she, who, uh, whom I, by the way, six months early, earlier had stood up on a chair in a class proclaiming, I will never go to school again. I am done. Um, and then, uh, well, life, life corrected me on that. So uh, once, once I decided I was going to actually do that, that I knew that I didn't want to put the pictures in the envelopes, that I wanted the, to do this thing somehow, but I knew I wasn't trained for it, I, I think that was sort of the, the thing that made me understand that uh, you have to apply uh, yourself if you're actually going to do it. It wasn't just going to happen. I had to yeah, maybe yeah. learn a little something. Uh, so when it, that decision was made, and uh, then you set about looking at graduate MFA mm -hmm. acting programs, 
And uh, so what was that process like, and how did you arrive ultimately in Chicago on that cold, blustery day mm -hmm. in our little in room February. to audition yes. for it? Um, <laughs> I uh, had <clears throat> my, my, my undergrad professor that day in my car when I was near tears calling from uh, the ProEx <laughs> parking lot. Um, he, his first recommendation was to go and get a copy of American Theater Magazine and, uh, and flip through it. Uh, and look at the programs that are advertising in there, see what kinds of things I might be interested in. And uh, I was with my dad, um, who, again, he's from Ohio. And um, we were flipping through it, and we saw uh, the ad for Case, which said, you know, they take eight students every two years, um, which is pretty uh, low numbers. And um, I said, oh, look at this, Dad, Cleveland. I could go back to, you know, we're big Browns fans. I would go back, I, although, Last night was a. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, <laughs> he said, "We look at this, Cleveland," and he said, "Yeah, they take uh, eight students every two years. Good luck with that." And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah." Uh, so I, I kind of put it on the list just as a, a dare, really, with my dad, and applied and got the uh, audition slot. A lot of these processes are you apply and then you can maybe get an audition slot, and if you get the audition slot, then maybe you can get pass that to a meeting and then, and then it's, a whole, it's a whole process. But um, so, so it was really just finding, flipping through American Theater to get an idea of the type of program I wanted. And I quickly found that I wanted a three-year program. I wanted a conservatory style training. I didn't want it to be overly academic because I already knew uh, homework was not my jive. Um, <laughs> and uh, I wanted it to be mostly sort of practical learning. You know uh, that it was that you got up in the morning and it was all about acting instead of sort of uh, an academic study of it. Like I said, so um, I, once I narrowed that down, the, this this sort of made a lot of sense. And you walked into that little tiny room, yeah. and um, uh, there we sat. Um, I'll go into some embarrassing things mm -hmm. later, but uh, how yeah, would wait. you describe your three years in Cleveland studying? To be an actor, how would I? How would you describe it? Years? Ooh. Lipton um, would say, "What use two words to describe you?" But I won't, I won't do that to you. Uh. Um, uh, super intense. Um, I think that I know, I know. There's no real one way to describe it. I think that that. What surprised each, you about coming into this situation? Well, well, a lot of. I mean, each year it has sort of its own personality. Yeah. You know, of those three years, that first year is sort of this kind of where, where you start to kind of understand that everything um, you've learned so far is um, not correct and um, <laughs> that that all needs to be sort of uh, replaced. And so there, there's this sort of um, breaking down and then once uh, they have you beaten, the second year <laughs> is where it really you just kind of... Yes, yes, no, no, it's all love. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's a really, it is like psychologically, it's, it's a, it's a di difficult, pursuit anyway, mm -hmm. psychologically. And then I think that, that with grad school where, you know, it's in this program in particular, you have eight people who are in the same room, those first two years especially. Yeah. Um, the third year becomes slightly different. You get, a, or at least it did when I was here, you get a little more freedom. It's a little more of the kind of professional life of being an actor. You, you're, you're doing things at the Cleveland Playhouse and you're sort of, you're, you're actively doing things. Um, but those first two years, we were sort of sequestered, and it was, um, you know, it's a, it's a pressure cooker. Uh, I know I told every member of my class at some point that I hated them forever. I never would speak to them again. Um, and, uh, the, I mean, amazing. But, but you, you come out of it with a very sort of, I, I've compared it to being siblings, and I've compared it to being, mm -hmm. Not that I've been in a war, but I think it, it, I can <laughs> compare it to being in a war, in that you have this shared experience where you've seen each other in very dark places. All of us at some point were you know, crying in front of a room of, <laughs> of seven other people who were just looking at you, uh, <laughs> judging you. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but so you, you have this shared experience, and I think you leave, and, and you don't always like each other, but you do love each other, and it's a very, uh, in that way, it's like siblings, I think, mm -hmm. that that there's not a member of my class that I would, w w wouldn't do e anything for. I would, do, I would do whatever I could for them. There's a lot of negatives in that statement. Let me try that again. <laughs> Every member of my class, I would do anything for. And, um, uh, but, but, you know, not that we don't talk every day right. still. I mean, one of them I talk to every day, because we got married. But um, <laughs> the rest, 
they're, you know. She's glad to hear that, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, um, that, that decision, again, is on the one hand, uh, people jump into these things, into a three-year training program, and not really knowing why, except that that seems like something they need to do. So, in that regard, Ultimately, what did you feel you took away from uh, an intensive program uh, in that regard? I think, uh, I mean, the, the thing that I wanted to take away mm -hmm. is exactly what I did take away, which was at, at the very, at the minimum, what I wanted to leave with was a sort of how to approach a role. You know, how to, from the, the page, start creating a character, which was, was not something that I had any idea about. I mean, in undergrad, I think that I learned that I could, I had a natural cadence on mm -hmm. stage that I could speak and it could sound, uh, it could sometimes sound spontaneous, mm -hmm. which I think is like the number one hurdle. Uh, but then after that, it was about, now how do I take that and then um, insert that into something that feels different right. to me each right. time? And um, I, I, I definitely left with a, a sort of toolbox of that kind of information. What I also left with, which I didn't know I was leaving with, was I, mean, I remember you saying first year that um, a lot of this stuff is not going to sink in or it's not going to seem relevant until seven or eight years from now. Um, because it, it is so much information in such a short amount of time. You're, you're really like learning a billion techniques in and, and sort of applications and ideas in two years, basically. Uh, and uh, it is impossible to see how it's all gonna sort of shake out um, until, li and literally, I've, I've told this story to each of the classes. Uh, I've met all of the classes since ours, and to each of them I say, you don't, you don't have to believe me, you won't believe me, but remember that I said this, that there are still moments now that I will be on a set, or especially this summer doing, doing the play, um, where something will pop up and I'll be like, oh my God, that's what he was talking about? <laughs> you know, that it just, and it was something that I might not have thought of in 10 years, but then it, it kind of will, will just present itself and it's, um, it's kind of, it's a neat, it's a neat little uh, magic trick the way that works actually, <laughs> kind of like It's that. stored way that's back right. there, yeah. <clears throat> Part of uh, being in this program and a number of programs in the United States as a, the New York City agent showcase that the students have to kind of subject themselves to. Uh, this is the, the thing about uh, this program that uh, we hope will help launch them into the profession very quickly. So in some ways it saves a student about five to 10 years of pounding the pavement in New York just to meet the people that they're going to see in these very compressed experiences in the showcase. Um, so you can imagine that there's a certain stress level to training for three years intensively, doing all the performances, and then suddenly your world narrows down to this pinprick of 30 minutes. And that's the time you get to prove to all these people out there that you're viable, that they want to represent you and make money off of you. That's the whole point, you know. The, um, so I think this is one of the things that's hardest to deal with, but I think you, uh, you had a, a situation that could have been even more fraught for you on that uh, mm -hmm. evening of the uh, showcase. Um, just tell us about your showcase experience, if you would. I, I think this is, this is too good. I mean, well, <laughs> this, this is one of the best things in the world. Well, I, I, um, I, I decided to take my mind off the showcase. Um, it was you know, purely tactical yes, um, yes, by, yes. by uh, deciding to propose to um, one of my classmates after the showcase. So I had really, truly, um, the showcase was uh, not even on my brain uh, when, you know, the, I had a prop in the show, which was my backpack, and inside of that backpack was the engagement ring that my father had uh, so generously helped me with because I wasn't, uh, I was temping. <laughs> and, <clears throat> um, you know, there was a point where I throw the backpack and all I'm thinking is like, oh, there goes that ring. You know, so it was like, it, it clearly made it a little easier to focus. It, it wasn't actually tactical. My goal was that, that I, you know, I knew that I was uh, going to propose to one of my classmates uh, and um, I just thought it was, because uh, I talked earlier about that sibling stuff and all that shared experience, 
it only made sense to do it in a place where all of all eight of us were going to be because that and I knew that wasn't going to happen and hasn't happened since. I mean, the the, the I've seen everyone uh, since then, but all eight of us have not been in the same spot since that night. Um, so that was a little, uh, I had something else on my mind. And I remember uh, Virginia uh, saying to me that she just thought I was like, she was like, he must just be freaked out about the showcase because he's barely spoken to me all day. <laughs> um, which I always love that when someone's going to propose, yeah. uh, the way they usher that in is by like not speaking to the person <laughs> that they're going to propose to at all. I've heard that that's common. That's yes. good news. Um, but yeah, and, uh, and then we, we had the showcase, which was... Well, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, uh, there was a big party afterwards to celebrate the, uh, everybody's chaos and relieve the stress and drink heavily, I think, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, after the showcase, the agents give us their responses. So I was sitting on all these responses, and Rich actually got the most responses of the entire class from Close. the agents. And uh, it was, uh, so I, I knew that. And then the next thing I know, he's down on one knee proposing to this very lovely woman that he ultimately married. She said yes, thank God. Thank uh, I was concerned. That could have been a bad night. <laughs> that could have been a bad night. It could have been a very bad night, yeah. But anyway, it was, it was, a, it was a fabulous evening. Um, what happened between that fabulous moment and The Devil Wears Prada? How was that um, in New York? Uh, well, uh, out of that showcase, I... Um, was very fortunate to have sitting in the audience a man named Harris Spilios. And Harris um, was one of a two-person management team, uh, Davis Spilios Management in New York. And Harris um, circled my name and wrote, you know, call for a meeting. And uh, so they were the first place that I called. You know, you, you could either get marked no response or you could mark, you know, send in your headshot and resume so that they can just kind of put it in their files and never call you again. Um, <laughs> Or there were the ones that said, you know, call for a meeting. And I had a few that were call for a meeting, and, and Harris was one of them. And so I went in and met Dale and Harris. Uh, they were my first meeting. Showcase was on a Monday night. They were my first meeting on Wednesday, and we just hit it off fantastically. So I began to sort of check in with them with every meeting that I took um, from there on. And uh, it was very clear right away that, that I had the most rapport with them. Uh, so I signed with them right away. And they uh, immediately introduced me to uh, Paradigm, which is an agency in New York who has both a, a legit side and a commercial side, legit being theater and, and TV and movies, and uh, uh, commercial being, you know, commercials. And um, so I, I signed with Paradigm commercially as well. And um, about a month after the showcase, maybe three weeks after I, I had booked a uh, a Bud Light commercial, right. which helped things a little, immensely. Yeah. yeah, kind of moved things forward. So uh, Paradigm and I started working very well together, and still Dale and Harris were sending me out on legit stuff, uh, but the commercial stuff started kind of kicking right away. Um, and then uh, I uh, auditioned. I was auditioning for, for TV and things, and nothing was happening really. Um, and then I did an audition for The Devil Wears Prada. Mm -hmm. And I was actually in Minnesota at the time because we were getting ready for our wedding, which you know it was about a year later. And um, uh, our showcase had been on July 25th. I then did, um, I did an audition by video, and the director and casting agent asked if I would fly out for a callback. And that callback happened to be July 25th, uh, one year later from the showcase, and it was at the callback that they, they told me that I, uh, after I did the audition, they, they said, great, well, we have Anne Hathaway, Meryl Streep, and you, you're the third person cast. And I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know, all right. <laughs> um, uh, so it was kind of not a bad way to, you know, and then we got married August 13th, so it was not a bad, uh, not a bad month or so there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what did that little experience do for you career-wise in terms Prada? of... Prada? Prada, yes. Um, would it, I mean, would it direct, I mean, indirectly, it's been something that, you know, pe people still now that I'm meeting sure. uh, reference, in, and it's, it's very, I mean, it was, it was an incredible experience. It was my first time on set 
that wasn't a commercial and that I wasn't doing like background. I did a, a couple little background things right when we got to New York just to kind of see how a set worked, just to, you know, which, which I would recommend to people to try to do background just enough to see how a set works and then um, get, get out. Oh, background, uh, being an extra, sorry, uh, being, like being an extra. Um, I would say to do, to do that, um, just to, so you can kind of figure out you know, who, who the AD is and you know, why uh, that, that guy stands over there and yells at that guy. And you know, it's, it's good to know sort of how it works. And I think doing, doing background helped me with that. But um, the way that it kind of directly helped my career was uh, to, to open the door as far as getting me in for pilot auditions. I, we shot it in October and then pilot season came around in that, um, you know, starting that next January. And um, g as a new actor in town, it's sometimes hard to get in for pilot auditions. And um, I uh, ended up doing about 35 pilot auditions that year, which was a really great number of things. And, and I was able to get in any door we wanted because I had Devil Wears Prada on my resume. Um, so in a direct way, that was, that was how that worked. And that was the pilot season um, that, that led to Mad Men was out of that. And um, I, you omitted, you kind of glossed over your uh, audition tape that you created for oh, yeah. Devil Wears Prada. Mm -hmm. um, I, acting is, is a very interesting process. Um, it kind of hinges on the very tiniest of things. And uh, Rich did something, I don't think it was consciously smart, but no. it turned out to be wonderfully so. It paid off and, somehow. <laughs> So uh, tell them about that audition tape that you had to make for the uh, Devil Wears product. You're referring to the part that I was drunk. Yes, yes, okay. yes. yes. Um, <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, basically, I had gone to... Uh, Theater stories. Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I was working sort of temp job that summer as we were getting ready for the wedding um, at the Ordway Center in Minneapolis, uh, working in their box office. I'd worked there before. And uh, at 5 o'clock, I knew I had to get this audition taped um, and sent off overnight to... Uh, to New York, and um, I, my friend Keegan lived kind of up the street from the Ordway, so I, I, at five o'clock I left work, I went to Keegan's, and I was like, I gotta, you know, he, he had agreed to do this thing. And I got in there, and his roommate was having a barbecue, and uh, it was noisy, and Keegan was like, you wanna just stick around for a little bit, this'll die off, and then we can do the thing. I was like, all right, fine, let's just hang out, but I, I do have to, I'd like send it by midnight, and I have to send it. And he was like, no problem, no problem. Um, and then the time sort of went on, and. We were eating, and there, were, there was beer, and um, I had the, those things, food and beer. And uh, it was then 9 o'clock, and I was like, oh my god, we, I, have to, I have to do this. And the party is not stopping. Um, it never was going to. So we went to the rooftop of his building in St. Paul, and uh, you know it's a beautiful summer night, so the sun is just setting. And we put the sunset behind me, and uh, I sat in like a lawn chair. And uh, I had a beer. And Keegan's like, you want me to take your beer? I was like, nope. He said, all right. And he had a plate of pork chops that he was eating. And I said, let me have those pork chops too. And so I had the beer sort of here and pork chops here. And I just, look, if someone tells you you have an audition for a movie with Meryl Streep, you know you're not going to get it. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you do. Like, you could be eating pork chops and drinking beer because it doesn't matter. They already aren't going to cast you. So um, I was eating pork chop, just mouth full on all of my lines, um, drinking beer in between lines. And um, yeah, I've watched the audition tape since. I mean, it's, it's nice and easy. It's all ease. There's no tension, that's for sure. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, and then the next, the next I heard was when I was being flown out for the callback. Yes, yes. <laughs> which was, believe me, as ridiculous to me as it must sound to everyone else. Well, the one thing that, uh, as one of Rich's teacher, teachers, and there's some other folks here too who have been part of his process here, um, the one thing that I, I've enjoyed watching Rich do, on, on, uh, whether it's on stage or whether it's on film or TV, uh, there's there's uh, always a sense of kind of an everyman humanity that Rich brings to the work, uh, which is not the easiest thing to do. There's a sense of this guy is trying to survive like we all are in everyday life, and there's a sense of connection with his humanness. And that's something you can't teach people, and Rich has been able to have that uh, just because of who he is. 
and uh, it's a gift. And so everybody has their strengths and, and what have you, but uh, Rich has always uh, appeared to be very comfortable and in, the, in that world and yet completely there, and that's, that's, a, that's a talent. Uh, and there's a sense of truth in all of that that, again, is, is hard to teach. You can encourage, but it doesn't always, isn't always there. There's an uncomfortability in front of people, and Rich has always been able to circumnavigate that somehow. And uh, so I'd like to open it up for, unless you want to say something on your own. No, I agree. I'm okay. the best. Yeah, you are the best. <laughs> There's some personality flaws we won't get into, <laughs> but other right. than that. You know, uh, <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions from all of you. Yes, sir. You referenced several times that you were going to propose to one of your classmates. Mm -hmm. Did you have one particular in mind? <laughs> <laughs> The question was if I had a, um, a particular classmate More in mind. Well, I understood it was whoever was, happened to be there at the moment. Yeah, you know, that so. I was going to propose to. <laughs> <laughs> I did have, well, I thought the one that I had, uh, the one that I had been making out with for a year was, <laughs> I thought the most sensible one to ask. I, but it really, I mean, we had a beautiful class. It could have been any of them in the moment. Um, but I stuck with her. I thought. Thank God you got to her early before drink was taken. Exactly, in. exactly. <laughs> Yes, she's a lovely, well, she's working now in New York with a, a group of, of our uh, grads in their own, they have a Shakespeare company that they created there in the city, and she's there away from the kids. He has two beautiful kids, uh, and uh, they're down in Columbus, mm -hmm. and he's off to see his lovely wife perform, so uh, that's, that's coming up for him. Yeah, she's in a, in a new play called uh, Island, and it's written by uh, one of the grads from Case, the, the class ahead of us. Yeah and directed by another w member of his class, um, and uh, features actors from throughout yeah. the classes of Case, and, and other New York actors as well. Right. But I think there are, I mean, I don't know how many Case people are involved in it, but I think it's what somewhere in the neighborhood of eight or nine right. uh, out of the, the 20 or 30 people involved, right. which is a really kind of a cool thing. Other questions? Yes, sir. We have a microphone here for you, if you would. <laughs> You're obviously uh, pretty young and, and, and talented, all right? As an actor, do you have a long-term goal, like I must have an Oscar or I want my name on a building? Oh. <laughs> no, my name is on buildings all over campus, by the way. Uh, if you look <laughs> in the right spot, it's all over. <laughs> um, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I don't have that kind of a goal. I mean, I always sort of, uh, I mean, I've said this in interviews before, I did have, like, the only sort of unspoken goal that I had was to have a, a, a legacy job of some point, or of some, uh, of some version. Not, not like a, a legacy in like the, you know, that I must be remembered, but a job that I could, you know, when uh, everything dries up and uh, nobody remembers who I was, I can say to my grandchildren at least, you know, at one point I did this thing that was actually really cool. And that, that sort of already happened with Mad Men, I feel like. And uh, I mean, from here on out, I mean, it could be Mentos commercials for the rest of my life. I really don't. Uh, I, I feel fulfilled in what I set out to do. I, I, I also, I mean, I'm an ambitious person. I do want to continue working. Um, plus, I have mouths to feed. Uh, and so that is uh, a big driving factor. But I don't, I, don't, um, I mean, an Oscar, uh, those are, I've seen them, they're neat. But I don't. <laughs> I don't feel like I, I necessarily need those things. Um, yeah, I, I, my, my only real goal is just to continue making my living doing this. That really, if I could just keep that going, um, I think that is a tough enough feat uh, without worrying about that kind of uh, notoriety. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, in, in the Lipton episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh huh. work and uh, how they had to be these guys, you know. I mean, it wasn't they couldn't make up a character. Right. right. So, kind of my question is, how much of you is in Harry? A lot. Uh, I mean, the characters are are written f for us. You know, obviously, when when we've been on the show, uh, if you've been on the show for more than one episode, then the character quickly begins to become more like you. Um, and I think that. Uh, that, that happened for Harry, you know, if you, in the pilot, we are all very, you know, the guys on my level were very neutral. 
just sort of guys who say yes to Pete and drink and look at people. Um, uh, but but uh, um, as time goes on, quickly, Harry quickly became from Minnesota. This was all established in the first season. From Minnesota, I'm from, or I'm sorry, from Wisconsin, I'm from Minnesota. Um, he was one of the only married guys in the office. I was, at the beginning of the show, one of the only married people on the show. He has a daughter named Beatrice Grace. I, we were there first, my daughter's Beatrice Grace as well. But um, So there are a lot of ways that the character, and, and then the way that we, I think the way that it's mostly about us is the way that we interact with each other. Um, a lot of our sort of uh, interplay on the show is based on our relationships in real life. Uh, Michael Gladys, who's no longer on the show, but he played Paul Kinsey, the guy with the beard and the pipe. Um, uh, Paul and Harry always sort of bicker. Um, that is um, uh, just straight out of <laughs> straight out of out of us sitting and and uh, me calling him an arrogant prick. And you know, uh, he's also one of my best friends. To be clear. Um, I call a lot of people arrogant pricks, but he, um, he, he, he was just, um, that, that, that kind of interaction was, was built into the show because of how we are in real life. So, I mean, there is obviously, people are doing things different, like Vincent Carthizer, who plays Pete Campbell, is nothing like Pete Campbell. I would say he's the, the one that fars, falls farthest from his character. Um, Vinny is very, uh, he's, he is, is truly more than anyone on the show uh, acting and, and doing it well. Um, the, the rest of us are sort of, I think, playing shades of, shade, the, the shades that Matt picks out of us to, to put into the characters. Can I have one more? Mm -hmm. So my favorite character in Matt is Sally, right? Mm -hmm. Which is your favorite character? It is. Why? Why is Sally my favorite character? No, no, my favorite oh. character is Sally. I was, saying, I was asking you. Oh, which is my question mark? Yes. Oh, <laughs> Sally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Sa Sally is, I mean, Roger has the best lines, but I think that Sally, <laughs> Sally is, is my favorite. Uh, just because you're, you're seeing this sort of, it's one thing to watch the 60s reflected on now. You know, 2012, we're seeing the 60s. And it's all, you know, as historically accurate as we try to make the show, it is through the lens of now, right? So it is different. And you see things that hopefully are happening on the show that are resonating with things that are happening now. That's the goal. Um, with Sally, it's sort of like a meta thing of that, where she, you're seeing that world reflected in her. Um, and it is, uh, I mean, you know, for my money, I've said this to Matt, which means it'll never happen. But <laughs> I think that the finale, uh, you know, the, that final moment of the show, I, I, don't, I literally don't care what happens to any character except for Sally. I want to see Sally in like 20 years. I will be heartbroken if I don't get to see or have some idea of what happens to that little girl who grew up, grew up in that environment. Um, I think that's the most sort of intriguing part. I mean, when, when uh, spoiler alert, but it's a couple years ago, so if you haven't seen it, you're never gonna see it. Um, <laughs> when when uh, Sally's grandfather died, and the way that her family was with her, and sort of dismissive, and there's this shot of her laying on the couch or on the floor watching the news, um, and it's, just upset, I mean, she's, it's just like devastating. I don't know why it's devastating, I guess that's kind of the thing about the show, but that that little moment of this little girl laying down, listening to people sort of fight in the kitchen and nobody cares that she is like destroyed by this event. Um, I, I don't know, I think that's the, some of the most compelling stuff that happens on the show. There's a, uh, an interesting sidebar. Uh, in terms of the end of the first season, I don't know if you recall the uh, the image, the opening image, if, you have, if you've seen the show, uh, the, there's an image of a man falling off of a building. And um, there was some consternation about who that was. And for mm -hmm. many people thought it was John Hamm or John Hamm's character leaping from the building. Uh, at the rap party for the first year, Rich had an interesting experience. Well, yeah. Well, let me preface by saying okay. the guy falling, I think, always and forever is Don's it's an it's a image. I mean, it's meant to be an evocative image. Right. But the question always was, people always Ooh. thought that was like a harbinger that somebody was going to yeah. fall off the building. They had, at the, when they broke the stories for the first season, uh, Harry Crane, my character, was supposed to jump out of a window uh, to his demise. Um, and the way it was told to me, there were two reasons he didn't. Um, one was uh, that Matt felt it was too cliche after you know, we had the credits and everybody thought somebody was gonna jump out a window, so then it was like, okay, well, nobody's ever jumping out of a window. <laughs> um, and then um, 
the second reason was that uh, Virginia was pregnant throughout that whole first season and um, that Matt felt bad uh, <laughs> writing off a character uh, who, the, when the actor who plays him uh, has a, a pregnant wife at home. Um, nothing about how I play the character or <laughs> people like having me around. It was all just story and guilt. That's it. But you found out at the rap party yeah. from the writers. Right, you? You found yeah. out the writers, the writers let me know that that was, uh, <laughs> that was something that was going to happen, was that Harry was supposed to kill himself. So uh, I'm glad that didn't happen. Um, this would probably be a very different yes, event. Yes, uh, we'd all be sadder. That's right, now, that's yes. right. Uh, another question. We'll need you to speak into the microphone because we're streaming this and recording it. So oh, yes. You're live on tape. I'm so intrigued by your audition tape. Um, can you tell us what material you did while you were eating your pork chop? <laughs> <laughs> um, for the most part, if you're auditioning for TV or film, and even most like specific plays, if you're auditioning for a specific play, you're doing sides, which are cuttings from the material itself. So I did uh, two scenes from what was then the script for The Devil Wears Prada. One of those scenes got entirely cut out. Um, there was a scene that was supposed to happen after, you know, uh, there's, there's like this art gallery show in the, in the movie where, uh, you know, we're all at the art gallery and then I'm sort of led away to meet somebody. And there was a scene that was in the script, we never shot it, but it was in the script where then uh, I had another scene with Anne Hathaway and I compared her to a shrimp in some way. I, I was eating a shrimp and I was like, you're like this shrimp. That was one of the other <laughs> things. Um, probably a terrible scene, I'd probably better that it was cut. Uh, because if I, had, if I just thought of me saying, you're like this shrimp and it made me sort of uh, angry. So. Um, but yeah, so the thing that I did was, was uh, stuff from Deborah's Prada. As far as like doing some, like a general audition, you know, you're auditioning for a theater to consider you for other plays, then, then you would pick your own material. But it, for the most part, um, you know, whether it's for a commercial or for a movie or a TV show or, or a, a play, most plays, it's going to be specific stuff from that um, script. Which was really interesting when I auditioned for Avatar, by the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, James Cameron had not yet fully written the language uh, that the Navi were going to speak. And literally, they were like, well, here's what you're saying, but it's in another language, so you just make up the language. And I was like, um, <laughs> so just, 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 just j gibberish, but, but that's what I'm saying. And they were like, yep. Yeah. Like, this is going to be so fun. <laughs> It was awful. It was awful. <laughs> and three years later when Avatar came out, I was like, oh, that w oh, God. <laughs> well, that would have been a good job to get, but <laughs> Ugh, that, that audition. <sighs> Other questions? Yes, Kim. Um, I'm a graduate of Minnesota State Moorhead, which is actually across the street now from Dragons? Before, yeah. No. What are Dragons, they? Dragons, yeah. <laughs> How did you like living in Fargo? Not being from there, because I had the same experience not being from there and, you know, living in Fargo, and then everyone hears about it later and is like, what? Yeah. Well, I lived in Moorhead. I lived just across the river, but uh, it's equally as uh, cold. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I don't know if you've been back since, but actually, uh, I went back this, I was a guest at the Fargo Film Festival. Um, no? Uh, this <laughs> this um, mar March. And uh, it is cold, um, but it's also grown up a lot. Um, the town, like the Fargo proper, is really has really gotten. You, you guys, I know, want to hear this. Um, really has it's actually gotten pretty hip, and it's very artsy. Um, when I was there before, uh, you know, the, the school that I went to is super conservative, or or was at the time. I hope that they've loosened up a little bit, um, and it was uh, a very. Um, it was kind of a, it's. I mean, you find that the theater people, this happens anywhere, I guess, because theater people are sort of by nature the outcasts of whatever place they are. Um, so we sort of segmented off and we were like, screw those guys and we're not hanging out with any of those people. And um, uh, so it was sort of a hard four years, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's great. It's great, it's not, not, not good skiing, it's very flat. There's another question here. Uh, here she, she's coming with the microphone. She's coming. 
is there a role, a director, or another actor you'd really like to uh, play uh, or work with? We were talking about Mitch in Streetcar yesterday. I think that would be a, uh, as far as plays go, that would be a, a role that in a few years I would love to play. Um, uh, I played Tevya in college <laughs> when I was 20, 22 years old. I I'm might, back to the singing thing. Right? I might like another crack at that <laughs> in, a, in about 20 years. Um, uh, such a good role. I was so right for it. Um, <laughs> and uh, as far as like actors, directors, I did, you know, Ron mentioned Chris Messina in, in this thing. Uh, when Chris was in Fairhaven, he was also in, Chris Messina, by the way, is in everything right now. Everything that is there in the world, he's in. He's, <laughs> he's currently a regular on the newsroom and the Mindy Project, uh, Mindy Kaling's new show on Fox. Uh, and he was on the last two seasons of Damages, and we did three movies together in the last hiatus, uh, Giant Mechanical Man and Fairhaven and Celeste and Jesse Forever. Um, he is someone I think that something about the way we work together, I would, I would like to work with him again. Mm -hmm. um, we really, uh, we had a ball, and he's also a hell of an actor, and um, he makes me better, for sure. So uh, I would like to work with him again. And director-wise, I mean, I, you know, there, any of the any of the directors on Modern Family? I would like to be on Modern Family. I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, that is a show I would like to uh, to pop up on sometime. Um, but yeah. One of Rich's other um, interests uh, that has held him in good stead is uh, is interested in improvisation and comedy, and he is very much um, from what I can gather from uh, the internet, very much a part of the comedy scene in in uh, Los Angeles. And um, uh, it's very exciting, and I'm, I think you've continued to work on that all the way through your experiences. Yeah, I think, I mean, when I first got to New York, that was kind of where I found home base was at the uh, Upright oh, Citizens right. Brigade in New York. Um, it's an improv theater, theater. Uh, founded by uh, Amy Poehler uh, from SNL now, and uh, Matt Walsh and Matt Besser and Ian Roberts are all uh, incredible uh, improvisers. And that was kind of where I was cutting my teeth on comedy, and, and I haven't, I mean, I don't, I don't improvise much anymore, but I do, um, I s try to stay, stick around and uh, watch as much as I can and get to know the people who are kind of up and coming in that, because I think it's, it's a pretty uh, exciting aspect of this. And it's a way that, you know, when, when you are struggling uh, to get an acting job, uh, it's a way to stay sort of potent is to improvise, yeah. um, because it, at least it gives you a chance to play any kind of character you want. Well, it's also, I think, been something that's uh, been to, in your favor as in auditions and Absolutely. just uh, being uh, ready to go any direction you need to go at the time, depending yeah. on what you're given. Yeah. I mean, the directions, the direction that you get in an audition can be pretty strange, <laughs> yes. and it can be hard left turns right. uh, that, that don't necessarily make sense, but you, uh, you know, being an improviser, uh, it helps you to make those decisions quickly and at least yeah. commit to them. They may not be the right decision, right. Um, but at least to commit, make a choice and commit to it, yeah. um, which is easier just having been an improviser. <laughs> what, we have time for about one more question. Anybody? <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Microphone, microphone. Oh, it's oh gone. that's all right. Share a great Mad Men cast story. With Share a great <laughs> Mad Men cast story that you can do publicly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I mean we, we, we all get along very well, luckily. Um, it's a very social place. It is like my sort of um, social club when we're shooting. Um, there are, there are times, you know, I will, I will often go in a little early or stay a little late, or even sometimes, if, it, if there have been a few days where I haven't been shooting, I will go in just to kind of hang out. We have a... Um, table at our base camp. You know, base camp is where all of our trailers are and, and makeup and hair and then our personal trailers. And then there's uh, the, the show because they recognize how social we are as our kickoff gift uh, last year uh, gave us this unbelievable patio set. So we have this big patio set with this big tent over it for the sun and uh, coolers and it's a very uh, social place. There's a pile of games sitting on the table. Um, we have an ongoing dominoes uh, game that has gotten very hot at times, very, very heated. Um, ham, by the way, uh, it's not fair. Um, I know he's very handsome. 
uh, and very good actor, but he also uh, will kick the hell out of you at Domino's. Um, uh, Domino's, Backgammon, uh, Pit, uh, these are the games that, that we play a lot. I mean, I, I don't really have a specific story except to say that we, we get along well, which is, which is nice, and we, um, I, guess, I guess it would just, I, I'm happy to say that if you stumbled onto the LA Center lot at some point, um, and wondered where all the yelling and sort of like hoopla was coming from. Uh, it's often our little uh, patio area where you know Ham has just dominoed someone, and uh, it's 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 just a, it's a nice place to be. That's the only. I wish I had like a. I mean, I do have store like you know, but it's the internet doesn't. I can't. <laughs> I've already said far too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for coming out, and I want to thank. Uh, this young man who's, who's uh, been a real gift to the program and uh, continues to be a gift to the profession, and we're very proud of him. And uh, a number of other of our, uh, all of our actors that come out of the program have done well and uh, acquitted themselves in this very difficult profession with a lot of integrity, and Rich is uh, one of them. I, yes. I want to say, too, real quick. I'm that, sorry, we that, don't have time, Rich. No, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the, this program is, is um, I hope that, that people understand, uh, it's a very unique program. And um, there, are, there are other programs that are sort of on paper trying to do similar things. Um, but the, the sort of facilities, the relationship with the Cleveland Playhouse, uh, the fact that you leave with your equity card, the specific teachers that are here, uh, you know, shoving things into your ears uh, that you, you resist, but then um, finally give in and accept. Um, it's, it's a very, uh, and, and things, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but the university provides you with a living stipend, which has now uh, been raised again. Um, they make it easy to be here. So those, those, those lucky select few that get in, um, it is a really uh, a particular kind of education that I think um, you're not going to find elsewhere. Um, environmentally and, and sort of socially and, um, and, and professionally. So uh, I, that's why I am always um, happy to be here and happy to do something like this. I want people to understand that this is, um, I would not be doing anything, anything, anything that I'm doing um, without, without having come here. Uh, I'm, I am forever grateful to Case for, for letting me come and do this and be one of those eight. And, uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to get to do something like this. Thank you all very much. Who did it?